I'm going to write on the board opportunity cost opportunity cost um, and 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 uh, positive and normative And I didn't, I'm just really trying to simplify things because we don't have much time for this particular segment. But <clears throat> if I was to ask you what did it cost you from an accounting perspective if you added up the dollars that you paid for this course and divided it by the number of courses, the number of evenings you're going to be here, how much would it cost you? Could you do that calculation if you knew the numbers? So this has come up with, let's just say, I don't know, $50, $100, whatever it is, okay? Would that be the cost of coming to this class? And most students would say, yeah. And if you said that, would you be thinking like an accountant or thinking like an economist if you said it cost me X number of dollars to come to class tonight? Class, you can answer that. Accounting, you're thinking like an accountant. That's an objective amount. But we're trying to think like economists now and not like accountants. Some of you might be mothers. You look like you might be a mother. Any, you don't have to answer that. If you were a mother and um, you had a child that was ill, maybe an earache or something like that, and they were very uncomfortable and they wanted their mommy very very badly because they were in a lot of pain can you identify with this no you're not a mother okay you but you you've been there personally you, you've been around the situation you understand what i'm talking about and if that mother says no i paid that i got grant money to go to this class and i signed a thing that i would go to the class and i'm getting part of it paid for and I don't want to leave my little child behind, but I got to go to the class because I made a commitment. What is the real cost? Are you thinking dollars and cents when you say, kid, you'll be okay. Here, take this pill or something. And you come to class and you think to yourself, oh, am I a good mom or not? I mean, my kid really, really needed me. And they were crying. They were scared. And I just, I just walked out on them. Is that a cost? Is that something that cost you something? Yeah. Is that a significant cost? Is it a cost that would might possibly change your mind about coming to class tonight? Yes. Are we thinking like an accountant or an economist? Economist. And how do people make their decisions? On an accounting basis or on an economic basis? On an economic basis. We're looking at subjective values of cost and benefit. So we're talking about opportunity cost. We're talking about this subjective economic cost that's not in an accountant's vocabulary. You do not find opportunity cost on any accounting statement. So if we were to list all the things that you could do rather than come to this class tonight, you could stay home with your kid. Now, Whatever's at the top of the list, that's what you choose to do. But remember, we use ranking over here to make our decisions. You could iron the clothes. You could go to a movie. You could mow the lawn. You could go out with your friends. You could do the wash. You could clean up the living room. All these things that you could do. But out of all these things, which one is your opportunity cost? Here's the one you did. If you didn't do this, you would have done that. Whatever second place is, that is your opportunity cost. That and only that is your opportunity cost because that's the opportunity that you actually did give up. Because that's what you would have done if you didn't come to class. And I would submit to you that whenever you're thinking about going to class or doing whatever else, 
in your mind, you are ranking all the different options that you have. And in your mind, this ranking is whatever comes to the very top, you do it. Whatever comes in second place is called your opportunity cost. Now that opportunity cost could be big, expensive, or it could be cheap and inexpensive. And the illustration I just gave you, if you had to emotionally devastate your child in order to come to class tonight, I'm saying that is a high, expensive opportunity cost. And you wish you didn't have to make it. But if you didn't have any crying kids, you didn't have anything else to do, you thought it would be more fun than anything else you could think of, your opportunity cost would be next to nil. Because you're not giving up anything, because that's what, that's what you'd rather do. So there's no cost. In fact, this is the benefit. It's not even a cost. So we can have high opportunity costs and low opportunity costs. Next, we want to talk about positive versus normative economic statements. Positive versus normative economic statements. We talked about this outer belt with Mansfield. And we talked about the idea we've got to get some way of talking to these people to convince them to raise taxes on themselves so that they have a better life. I know that sounds strange, but I think that's the way it works, isn't it? Isn't that kind of how it works? Pay more taxes so you can have it? I don't know. So we've got to get these people, we've got to get this bond levy passed, and so we've got to get a critical number. And so how are we going to do that? Well, we've got to get this economist on there, and we'll interview him. We'll have this talking head, and he has a Ph.D. in urban economics, and he can talk about all these different things that have happened to all these cities in the past when they put in an outer belt and how it was a net benefit for everybody. Yeah, everything that you do is going to cost you something, but it's good. It's a good cost if you get a good benefit out of it that's worth the cost. And so they're asking him all these questions, and a good interviewer, by the time they're done, they will say, well, thank you for sharing your expert opinion about this, but now that you're an expert on outer belts, um, from what you know of Mansfield and our location, um, do you think that, that we should pass this levy? I mean, that's a good question, right? Now, the reason I bring up that question is because at that point, the economist is no longer making positive economic statements. The interviewer has just asked them to give a normative economic statement. A positive economic statement attempts to explain how things work. If you put in this outer belt, you will reduce the number of traffic lights. You will reduce the number of time in transportation. You will draw more people in who would like to live around here who actually work in Columbus. Um, it, it will increase the tax revenues. It will have enough funds to get rid of all the potholes. It will explain how the economy works. Positive statements explain objectively how the economy works. Um, in my locale where I live, I live in pretty close to a lot of Amish um, people who keep outgrowing their family size and go off to Michigan or Pennsylvania or whatever. whatever. <laughs> but some of them don't want to stay Amish. And they're called fence jumpers. They jump the fence <laughs> and they put on their... English clothes and play English for a while and then change clothes and go back home sometimes. But sometimes they're permanent fence jumpers. And um, they know how cars work, but they've never done it. They know how buggies work, you know, but cars. And so if you get one of the lady fence jumpers, she would like to learn how to drive a car. <laughs> if you're English, you got to drive a car. You don't get buggies. The English people don't use buggies. So you're, you're trying to help her learn how to drive the car. You say, now that, that, that pedal on the, look down there. At the left, that's called a brake. You push on that, and the car slows down, right? The one on the right, you push on that, it's called accelerator. That speeds the engine up. So when it's in gear, you push on that, and you're going to go faster. If you push on the other one, the brake, you're going to slow down. Those are positive statements because they attempt to explain how the machine works. They attempt to explain how the machine works. But now we got her on the road, and we're driving around here. We're going around a corner close to the area where she's going to be taking her driver's test. We say, oh, there's some kids playing soccer over there. You should slow down. I know the, I know the speed limit's 15, but you should slow down to 10 or 5 because those kids, when they're playing soccer, you know, if it means the game, getting that ball back into play and win the game and running out in the street and risking your life 
to win the game, do you risk your life to win the game if you're a kid? Oh, absolutely. That's a no-brainer. <laughs> right? Absolutely run out of the street. What are you, chicken or something? We got to win this game. So you should slow down when you're going around the corner when they're playing soccer over here because they're kids and they don't have wise judgment. They make all sorts of stupid decisions. Now, when I say you should slow down, that is a normative statement because I'm not telling her how the car works. I'm talking about how she should work the car. See the difference? Now let's go back to our example here. We got the economist here. He's talking about the outer belt. He's talking about how the tax system and the revenues and how it applies to tax revenues and how it applies to bringing more economic activity. And now our interview asks them to answer not a positive question of how outer belts work, but a normative question of what somebody should or ought to do. Should we put in an outer belt? And once we go from making positive statements where the economist actually is an expert, they are expert, they know their stuff, but when we ask them to give a normative statement about what should be done or what ought to be done, realize something very, very important has just happened here. They've taken off their positive economic opinion, economic perspective hat, their PhD hat, and they put on their personal, my personal opinion hat. They're no longer talking about an expert. Now, I know they still look like an expert, still got a PhD in urban economics, but if we ask it, should we put that outer belt in here? And he goes, oh, of course. Well, he's an expert, and so I suppose we ought to believe him. No, not necessarily, because he's answering or giving a normative statement. A norm of statement is subjective, not objective. Positive, we're trying to be objective over here. Once we go normative, we're asking them to give their personal subjective opinion. And it might be the case that he just married into the Kokosing family. <laughs> and uh, he wants it to be a nice Christmas. And that's why he wants us to put an outer belt in. That's possible, isn't it? Yes, of course it's possible. So we have to distinguish between positive statements and normative statements. Normative, when we come down to, you can usually see the word should or ought in there. You won't see that in a positive statement. Push on this, you'll slow down. Push on that pedal, you'll go faster. Increase taxes and people might move out. Decrease taxes and people might move in, have a tendency to move in. Should we increase taxes? Well, let me say, let me do it this way. If he says, if we lower the taxes in the downtown square area of Mansfield, more businesses will move into the downtown square area and it will increase the economic activity of that area. Is that a positive statement or normative? It's positive. But what if he says, we should lower the taxes in downtown Mansfield in order to get more people to move down there? Now that's normative. You catch it? You catch it? And now what time is it? 7.15. I think that I'll cover just a couple more things and then we're going to call it an evening here. I want to just cover some definitions. Some definitions. They're in the text, so I'm not going to spend much time on them. And they're stipulated definitions. Uh, definitions that we make up because we want to define things and nail them down. One is called economic forces. And again, you can look them up in your book. Um, oh, I skipped something. I skipped something, and I'm sorry because I wasn't writing it down. Can you hold that for a second? When we're talking about economic opportunity cost, we're talking about a situation. I know you go back in your notes and write this down. We're talking about a situation where we have mutually exclusive choices. Opportunity cost comes up when we have mutually exclusive choices. If you come to class, you can't stay home with your sick child. That doesn't work. You got to go, you got to zig or you got to zag. So mutually exclusive choices. It's some, sometimes it said, you know, you can't walk and chew gum at the same time. And if you can't, well, that's a mutually exclusive. You can stand there and chew gum or you take it out and you walk. But you can't do both. 
Now, if you can do both at the same time, it's not a mutually exclusive choice. With opportunity costs, we're talking about mutually exclusive choices. And I skipped that. I'm sorry I skipped that. And so now we're back to economic forces. Economic forces are human reactions to the condition of scarcity. Human reactions to the condition of scarcity. And our text also talks about not just economic forces, but market forces, which we're talking about shifts in the relative value of goods based upon social goals. Now, again, these are in the text. You don't have to get them perfect. And then there's another phrase which you already covered uh, in tonight's lecture, and that's called the invisible hand. And the invisible hand is a metaphor for the price mechanism. That's this interaction of supply and demand and market equilibrium, which you learned about in your microeconomics class. That when the price goes up, people tend to look for substitutes or they don't buy as much. But when the price goes down, people change their attitude toward that. And they say, oh, that's cheap. You know, I left on vacation, all the air conditioning's running, but the cost of electricity is pretty cheap, so I don't really care. But if the cost of electricity was really expensive and you're 100 miles down the road, you stop, you call somebody, or if you have to, you go back and turn off the electricity if it's really, really expensive. So that's the invisible hand causing us to either, ah, forget about it, let the electricity run, or we stop and we go back and we turn it off based upon this invisible hand telling us what's in our own best interest. We're going to begin next time with economics as a social science. Next time we're going to begin with economics as a social science in contrast to a natural science. A natural science would be something like biology or physics or chemistry. And a social science would be studying the behavior of human beings. When we study the behavior of human beings, we're talking about a social science. And I'm bringing that up because economics is a social science. We're studying the behavior of people.